Well, let's go ahead and um, and start. We'll I'll have a prayer and and uh, then turn it over to to Dr. Hansen, who is Andrew to us and and very beloved. He and Claudia and and um, uh, we, um, you know, miss you, but you never for a moment are are not part of us. Even though I know that that you're you're not coming to the service, but you're watching the service and. Uh, and cheering us on every every Sunday. So um, you're just very loved, and I hope you know that and have a sense of it. Um, I think everybody knows me. I'm Bob Ayers, one of the one of the priests at, at the church, and I've been responsible for the Christian formation and coordinating these different things. Um, and you know, like all of us, it's been a really unusual season in terms of um, all the programming and different things that, that we've needed to do. Um, but this was particularly exciting. When we began this conversation with Andrew, uh, we were talking about uh, doing uh, kind of a two-part thing on Thomas Aquinas, uh, which, you know, certainly would be very interesting. And then just as he discerned and prayed and thought about it, thought about kind of his uh, specialty and um, his area and, and study, it gravitated towards creation care. Um, and uh, I, I don't even know that you knew that, that there was a team of, of folks that are focusing on this very thing in terms of creation care in real practical ways. Like we've done garbage pickups and we're doing a, a composting, we're doing little things like that. But it was really about getting people to recognize as Christians our responsibilities. So I see this as clearly a movement of the Holy Spirit that, that this is our topic and that Andrew is going to bring his uh, particular expertise to the conversation. And I think that he's gonna, gonna have a whole lot of really enlightening things for us um, in our time together. So Andrew, I very much appreciate you being willing and uh, able to do this for us. And so the Lord be with you. Your spirit. Oh, your spirit. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much um, for Andrew and his calling and his training and his his spirit that, that reverberates with your spirit, Lord, and, and what you uh, have put on his heart and his, um, his care and his insights that we are just so excited to learn from tonight. Uh, and we love you and we praise you and we lift up this time together as we really think um, more deeply from a very uh, Christian point of view, a biblical point of view, um, on what it means to be in the role that we have with all of creation. And um, we thank you for the beauty of it and the complexity of it and pray that we are really good stewards uh, of your of your kingdom uh, here on earth. And we love you and thank you for this time. We lift it up in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Um, partly inspired by the original idea to have talks about St. Thomas Aquinas, which is still very much on my heart, and I, I'm planning to do that. Um, I, I, I thought we could start with a wonderful short prayer that you may not have met. It's St. Thomas Aquinas' Prayer Before Study. And I let, let's pray this one together. Um, Creator of all things, true source of life and wisdom, lofty origin of all being, graciously let a ray of your brilliance penetrate into the darkness of our understanding. Can, can I ask you to mute yourselves because we're getting echoes? Um, Penetrate into the darkness of our understanding and take from us the double darkness in which we have been born and obscurity of both sin and ignorance. Give us a sharp sense of understanding, a retentive memory and the ability to grasp things correctly and fundamentally. Grant us the talent of being exact in our explanations and the ability to express ourselves with thoroughness and charm. Point out the beginning, direct the progress, and help in completion through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Well, the theme of both these talks is some um, dressing and keeping the Garden of Eden. And I should point out that I'm, I'm a plant biologist, basically a metabolic biochemist in the horticultural sciences department. We will be going into areas which I'm not an expert in, so that's why it's great to have a lot of other people here. Um, this is not what I really do in my day job, a lot of this. It's things that I've started to think about as a broader context for what we're all doing and what we're all facing in the next, <clears throat> in the next decades. Um, these talks came out of two Bible verses that jumped out at me. One is Genesis 2.15. This is the, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. And the other one is like a number of others in, in scripture, Jeremiah referring to the conflict between Jeremiah and the false prophet Hananiah, where Jeremiah says to the Hananiah, hear now, Hananiah, the Lord hath not sent thee, thou makest this people to trust in a lie. So the first of these two talks is about stewardship of the land and everything in it. And the second one related to the first is about or apparently authoritative misinformation, because Hananiah, were, Hananiah was an apparently authoritative source. To expand on that a little bit, stewardship of the land and what's in it, and apparently authoritative misinformation. The first talk tonight will be matter focused. That's the land, the water, the living organisms of Earth. And the second will be energy focused. That's fossil fuels, biofuels, electricity and minerals, but especially biofuels, because that's what we're just going to take that as a kind of cameo portrait of the whole. And um, the emphasis in the first talk tonight will be the scale and speed with which humans have taken over the land and the water and living organisms. And the thing of next Wednesday will be reality as opposed to what you could call misinformation. And throughout both of these talks, <clears throat> I, I'm going to be using a lot of numbers. These are uncontroversial numbers. They're widely accepted. Um, they're going to be in the form of charts, quite complicated ones, but I'll walk you through them. And please, if anything isn't obvious from what I'm saying, Put a hand up or turn the mic off and stop me, and I'll go over it again and try and explain it better. Um, I've tried to pick charts that are relatively easy. Um, so we're going to use uncontroversial numbers to reach what you could call inescapable conclusions. Before we start, here's a little bit of lighthearted stuff. This is from a TED talk given by somebody called Brent Logan called, Can We Create the Perfect Farm? So this is a 21st century picture of, a per, of the Garden of Eden revisited in which we have grain crops growing fruitfully in the background. We have fruit crops growing in the foreground. Notice that they're being tended by robots. Here's another robot here, this one here. The whole thing is being benevolently surveilled by a drone. And there's cute life, wildlife, a toucan and a rabbit in the middle of this in harmony. So this is a utopia. Well, no. I mean, this, this is sort of stands for some of the misinformation that's out there, actually. Uh, because as you probably know, if you have any experience of rabbits, uh, the rabbit isn't going to live in harmony with the fruit. It's going to spot it and make a beeline for it. So I think what would really happen in this utopia, it would be a dystopia in which the drone would see the rabbit seeing the fruit and then zap it, because then there might be some net production from the system. Otherwise, it would be a very fat rabbit and no fruit and no grain. But that is almost a, a metaphor for a lot of the things that with what you see in the media, beautiful things that just aren't real. Okay, stewardship of the land and what's in it. Um, speed and scale. 
let's begin with this chart, and you've seen many of these, I guess, of growth of the world's population and, and the arrival of landmark technologies. Uh, the population in billions or thousands of millions here, of course, it's now north of 8 million up here. It took about, from the beginning of humanity, which is way, way before this, from the start of the invention of agriculture, maybe 10,000 years ago, it took all the way till about 1700, 1800 actually, to reach the first billion people. Between 1800 and now, we've gone from one to eight billion. And along the way, all these technologies came along and what basically made this skyrocketing possible was a combination of the second agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, and above all fossil fuels. So this has been an enormously fast proliferation of humans in the last 200 years. And it's really this part of this graph that we're, we're going to be looking at next. During those 200 years, the land area used by humans as a fraction of the total land area on Earth is a ratio of about 0.3. In other words, we're now using for our purposes, about a third of the land area on Earth. Not very much more of it is usable except for forests, which we only cut down at our peril. Water resources, <clears throat> the river volume that humans control compared to the free flowing river volume, it's about one to one. So we're either damming and using for hydropower and irrigation or for other industrial urban purposes. We're using already half the world's water resources. So massive footprint on the on the climate from that on the planet from that standpoint. And just as a note, all the information that I'm using here, I've put links in this presentation to the sources. So if anybody wants to follow up on this, I can send you the presentation and the links will take you to where the data came from. And I emphasize these are very mainstream sources. So this is a statistic that doesn't immediately make, make sense. And when you do make sense of it, it's, it's shocking. This is a graph of the weight of biomass, and we'll come later to what biomass is, but it's basically the weight of all living organisms, animal, plant, and micro. And you can see from 1900 to the present day, it stayed pretty flat, maybe gone down a little bit. But in that time, the human-made mass, that's concrete in blue, aggregates like gravel in lighter blue, bricks, asphalt, metals, things like plastic, They've all rocketed up, particularly since about 1950, until now, the collective weight of everything humans have made is more than everything living on Earth. And what's particularly striking is basically within my lifetime, 90% of that happened. It's so fast. It's the blink of an eye in terms of even of human existence, let alone the whole, you know, the whole existence of Earth. Let's look a little bit more at biomass and where it is. This is a very interesting chart. The area of it is proportional to the weight of different kinds of biomass. So this brown area here, which occupies most of the area, is terrestrial biomass, in other words, things living on land, which you'll see in a minute, is mostly trees. The blue bit is that proportion of the total biomass, which is living in the sea, that's mostly animals. And this dark gray part is deep subsurface 
living organisms, which is mostly microbes, as you'll see. So this is a breakdown of this biomass. It's a little complicated. The plants are in, in brown. And as you can see, um, most of the brown is plants. <clears throat> the animals are mostly in the sea and the microbes, the gray, are mostly under the earth. So the great majority of the biomass on earth is terrestrial plants, mostly trees. The next biggest fraction is subsurface bacteria and, and a pretty small fraction is marine animals. Let's look a little bit more closely at animals, particularly mammals. And this is a truly shocking statistic and I'm gonna take you through it slowly. This is a similar chart to the last one where the areas of all these little segments on it refer, they're proportional to the weight of the organisms, and these are mammals. And an area like that is 10 million tons. So for example, these greenish sector, sectors are wild land animals, total about 20 million tons. And for example, they're, they're different kinds of animals. The elephants are specifically identified there, that little green triangle there. But you can see that terrestrial wild animals are a really small part of the area. In other words, a small proportion of the total mass of mammals on the planet. Well, how about the marine wild, marine wild animals? Rather bigger, twice the tonnage, 20 million tons, but of which the whales are the biggest uh, item. But again, it's really small compared to the total. Look at what humans are. Humans alone are huge. And the livestock they keep, particularly cattle, are substantially bigger than the humans. So that nearly all the mammalian biomass on Earth is now humans and their animals. And they fact little known is that when they did this budgeting, they include what they call rather pejoratively hangers on like mice and rats. And here's my mouse Rosita as a representative of the rodents. They're in here too. So there's not only domesticated, there are also these sort of, you could sort of call them hanger on animals. A statistic to take home from this is that domesticated mammals, that's cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, and so on, now outweigh wild land mammals 30 to one. And in the bird world, chickens now outweigh wild birds three to one. When I learned those numbers, I, I was shocked. I, I would have thought it would have been far less dominance of, of humanity, we've, we've really taken over. This is it in a more historical context, uh, the human impact on the biomass of mammals. Here, we're looking at the biomass in, well, this is in different units, it's in gigatons of carbon, but the relative numbers of the, what you wanna look at. 100,000 years before the present, which is well into modern humans, they've been around at least 60,000 years by then, the human part, the dark pink, you can't even see it. I mean, it's a tiny fraction of the total mammalian mass here, which is the orange. You can't, you wouldn't even see the little narrow stripe that was the humans. In the present, we decimated the wild mammals. We put a huge amount of livestock in there, and then we've become heavier than all the wild mammals that used to be there when humanity was just a very small number. So again, that's another way of looking at the rapid rise to total dominance of, of the system of humans. So now let's look at the other side of this, which is plants. And this is a chart of human appropriation of global land plant growth going from 1910 
to 100 years later. In 1910, humans were appropriating 13% of the land area of the planet in terms of grazing land in green, crops grown for food and feed in orange, woodlands used for fuel and construction, and fire used for burning for fuel, but also clearing land. And this narrow sector white of built up land where we're building roads and cities, towns. Between 1910 and a century later, we went from 13%, using 13% of the land, the plant growth on land to 25%. So that, that corresponds to the 25% number I gave you earlier. So what we did in a century was double the amount of land that we exploited for our purposes, which actually now we've banged up against the limits. There's really not much more available land to exploit. We doubled it. But in the same time, we went from 1.6 billion humans to about six and a half. That's a fourfold rise. Well, how did we do that? How did we get four times as many humans on only twice as much land? And that was this second agricultural revolution, the industrial agriculture. It was a combination of all these things and some more fertilizer, irrigation, mechanization of farm operations, pest control, and other things, but especially fertilizer and especially nitrogen fertilizer, because we'll go into the inventor in a moment, but we now take from the nitrogen in the air we reduce it industrially with hydrogen to make ammonia. And from then on, we make various kinds of nitrogen fertilizers. The hydrogen incidentally comes from natural gas, nearly all of it at the moment. So this is a very fossil fuel dependent process. You make ammonia from atmospheric nitrogen by this industrial Harbour Bosch process. And now, and for a long time, actually, for about at least 40 years, the amount of nitrogen that's fixed industrially has exceeded the amount of nitrogen fixed biologically on land. So you, you can see this number, it's showing it as about a ratio of one, but actually it's, it's higher than, there's more industrial fixation than there is natural fixation. So again, we've drastically, drastically altered the nitrogen economy of the planet. We're now putting in more inputs than all the natural ones put together. A word about the harbor in Harbor Bosch. Um, this is Fritz Harbor, who was a brilliant German chemist of the early 1900s. Um, but who led a life of deep irony and tragedy. And I, I, I encourage you to Google him because we can't go into it here, but it's, it's an amazing and moving story. In 1908, he was granted a patent for just what we saw there, synthesis of ammonia from its elements, which is nitrogen and hydrogen. Um, he did that in the context of um, both producing ammonia for um, agriculture and also for um, military use. And he received the Nobel Chemistry Prize for that contribution in 1918. And he's, his process is now enormously important in agriculture, and we'll see how, how important in a moment. But he was also the father of chemical warfare. And, and that's part of the irony and the tragedy of his, his career and life. This is more about nitrogen shown in a different way. Um, I need to explain that BNF is this biological nitrogen fixation. Certain bacteria, uh, the ones that are best known are the ones that live in the root nodules of legumes. They have the wonderful ability to take nitrogen from the air and turn it into nitrogen fertilizer, ammonia. And they do quite a lot of that. 
they do about um, 58 million metric tons on land on earth every year. That's basically, you could call them wild bacteria. There are also the ones that are in the agricultural legumes, that's called agricultural biological nitrogen fixation. It's a natural process, but we are managing it by planting whole fields of legumes. Okay. That's the fertilizer production by Harbour Bosch process, 120 million tons a year. The sum total of this biological fixation, be it by kind of wild bacteria, that would be 58 plus agricultural bacteria in legume nodules, 60. So you add those up, that comes to a bit less than 120. So again, fertilizer production looked at with these statistics, more than nitrogen fixation put together from biological sources. And the consequences of this in this graph, we're looking here at the world population in millions between 1900 and roughly the present day. The solid line going from about 1.6 billion to a bit shy of 7 billion where the graph stops is the world population and that's the, num that's the number we, we've seen already. The red dashed line is world population predicted if we didn't have Harbour Bosch nitrogen. So there it goes, way less. So if you derive the percentage of the world population that's fed by Harbour Bosch nitrogen, that's the dotted line. It was nothing until Harbour Bosch nitrogen was invented and then built out industrially in the, in the 20s. And from then on, it's gone up and up until the 50s. It really took off. And now up here, we have fully half the world population is now fed by industrially fixed nitrogen. And by the way, in, in your own bodies or our own bodies, uh, about a half the nitrogen in the proteins, actually more in this country, is coming from the Harbour Bosch process. You, you, you are a direct beneficiary of, we're all direct beneficiaries of Harbour Bosch in our, in our very bodies. So as a summary of this, before we get to a conversation, nearly all the suitable farmland and river water, we've already used that up. We're occupying it. If you add up humans and livestock, they're already 98% by weight of land mammals. Humans are already capturing 25% of all land plant productivity. The Harbour Bosch process is sustaining half of us. And it's an industrial process right now, really driven by fossil fuels. So here's my mouse Rosita who says, well, humanity is already outside its safe operating space. Uh, but actually, mice actually speak mouse and that translated that's eek. Uh, we're outside our safe operating space. So we can't have good conversations about stewardship for the coming decades and for the present unless we take on board just how much we're now steering the bus when the bus is the planet. It's not a natural planet anymore. It's a human managed planet and there's no more of it really that we can manage because we've already got all of it under our control. And we're already more than exceeding some of the limits of what we can do. And this is not a sort of ecological statement. It's really almost a chemical statement that we, we don't have the capacity to, to do more than we're already doing without really degrading further the resources on which we absolutely depend. So there's some good news too which we can talk about, but I'd like now to move into sort of a more discussion part with 
Mother Susan's wake up and move theme as the two parts of it, because the waking up part we, 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 we've been through, and I, I, I'm very happy to ask, answer questions and explain more about any of the numbers. But the question is next move. I mean, what, what, what do we do as a consequence of, of understanding just how big our footprint now is and how much bigger it can't get before, well, inviting really bad consequences? So let's start with a question about whether how much of this and what parts were a surprise to whom? Let's have some sort of thoughts on how much is really not what you were expecting. Bill. No. Is my mic on? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, well, I just, I don't know if it's so much a surprise. I'm just kind of disappointed we're that far along. It's more an accurate thing. I mean, I kind of knew it, but it's interesting to see all that documented out. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm just kind of, you know, what, well, what's the best we can do going from here? Because that's <laughs> all we can do. Yes. Well, I think that's that's the conversation we can have. But one of the things that we cannot really do is unhook ourselves from the Harbor Bosch nitrogen process. It would half of humanity depends on it, and organic agriculture has its place but unless we get really really good at recycling the nitrogen in the animal and human waste we cannot do organic and even if we do do the recycling it still won't be enough so organic agriculture is is important and valuable but it is not the full solution and we cannot abandon harbor bosch uh, which is an industrial process right now dependent on natural gas so that's that's a sort of negative answer, Bill. That's something we can't do. No. Um, now that doesn't mean you can't potentially use natural gas, you know, in a carbon neutral way. It's expensive, but you can. Um, yeah. I mean, there are some people here with engineering credentials who could maybe comment on that more. But uh, I think if I have one message, it's that we we owe so much to Harbor Bosch process that we can't unhook from it at this point. Well, I'd just like to comment regarding agriculture that a lot of corporate agriculture is done in a way that wasn't done when all the family farms were running. You know, Monsanto's and other big corporations. I mean, just the last 20 years, you can't find a quail. You know, there's no in the woods anymore. And that's just very recent. And that's a result of these vast deserts for wildlife that's been created by corporate farming. There's got to be a way we can produce enough food and make it sustainable at the same time in a land sharing methods. It's just profit is ruling as opposed to doing things in a correct, sustainable way by corporations. And they're not listening to none of us because they have farm exemptions in the United States. You can't even do anything about the problems that are causing at present for a lot of what I'm talking about because the corporate, you know, they're, they've got their money and hooks in their lawyers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I, Ken had his hand up very much, so please go ahead, yeah. Ken. Okay, I, I'll, I'm done for a while. <laughs> Ken, you'll need to unmute your um, Zoom. I can ask to unmute it, or else we won't be able to hear it. Ken, we're not able to hear you, bud.
Your, your mic is, your microphone is off, Ken. There it is, it's on now. Okay, um, retired engineer. Uh, I'll confess I'm a retired chemical engineer. So, uh, two areas, I'll try to be brief. Haber Bosch, I didn't work in the Haber Bosch, but I did work in the uh, oil industry, namely Exxon. Um, as you can guess, they they've all spent a lot of money in the produ production of ammonia, namely Harbor Bosch, you're right there. And uh, each year they have large symposiums in which they work on ways to tweak that process. And uh, as, you, as you've probably studied it more than I have uh, and uh, probably looked at uh, I'm sure they're looking at ways to tweak it and whether they can or not beyond its current capacity, I don't know, but you're right. It's it's one of the leading, it's fact the only leading way that I know of for manufacturing ammonia. So that is a point that, that you made. Uh, and I know that each year there is enormous, enormous sums that are put into uh, how shall I say it, uh, enhancing that process. You have no idea. You have no idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's all I can say, that I'm sure they are trying to considerably enhance that process. And as one that's been associated with those facilities, you have no idea the size and capacity that they have. Um, so... Mm -hmm. The second thing I would go to is water. And as you said, water is so vastly important. And you're right, uh, you're right that, that we are getting into a desperate situation there. And I would say the state of Florida is an absolute example of that. In fact, since the election of Scott, uh, the uh, Southwestern and all the water management districts, I am sad to say, were gutted of their scientists down to approximately 30% of their staffs. So you can imagine what is happening to the various water producing uh, situations here. Uh, I can just say that uh, uh, what that means is that a lot of the aquifers, the water, is being, you might say, ladled out for free. Uh, it's amazing. I would just point that out. You're absolutely right, Dr. Hansen. Water is in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. So I didn't mean to sound like a Jeremiah here, but uh, I agree with you on water. Well, Jeremiah is my hero. So, uh, Tony, you had a comment. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I would take a bit of issue, Andrew, with the idea that there's nothing we can do about Harbor Bosch. I'm afraid that it's, it's that kind of mindset that keeps you locked where we are. And as, as you clearly pointed out, that is a catastrophe. And so when what you're doing is killing you and killing your children and grandchildren, then you need to think of something different, more or less, no matter what the cost is. And it doesn't seem so impossible to imagine other ways of doing agriculture, which don't, for example, kill all the soil to begin with. So the only way to grow anything is to stuff it full of nitrogen fertilizers with all of the consequences of that, which are just absolutely poisonous for the whole environment. I mean, you know, you go down to the Everglades and it's basically a red swamp because of all of the nitrogen fertilizers that are running off into all the water, it's poisoning the water away. And it's basically destroying the soil. Soil is dead now, basically, across the whole planet. Because of the massive use of fertilizers, it's like addiction. You start with a little bit, get a hit, and then you've got to use more to get the same hit and more and more and more. And it eats you alive at the end of the day. And it's, 
just have to say no at some point. And that, yes, it's going to be incredibly difficult, but to just think that we're going to keep doing the same stuff with a few technological fixes is, I don't think that that's at all realistic. Sorry. Uh, well, we, we can have a conversation about that offline, but I mean, I, I think the, the reality is that biological nitrogen fixation is expensive in energy, no matter where the energy comes from. If it comes from natural gas making the um, nitrogen fertilizer, that's a huge energy subsidy. I mean, na to... natural gas is its own disaster. Well, that, yeah, that's another conversation. I mean, that's that's the different. I mean, <laughs> because you know, you're either going to destroy the planet by pollution or destroy it by overheating it, hmm. and it's our consumption-minded worldview. I mean, if you ask, you know, what do we conceive of as the good life? It's basically accumulating wealth. And this is obviously an unsustainable thing because it just means you just keep taking more and more, no matter how much you have, you, you've got to have more. And so you're not using resources to meet needs, you're using resources to make more wealth. And that was Bill's point. And I think Ken's as well about water use. Um, and also, you know, there, there, there is no family agriculture, as far as I can understand at this point in time, it's all basically, you know, large corporations using massive chemical fertilized amounts of fertilizer. Well, let, let me, let me just make one more comment only about energy and that the, if, if you don't give the nitrogen fixed already, you have to rely on the plant to supply the carbon to supply the energy to fix it, which means lower yields. You cannot have a self-fertilizing organic agriculture with the same yields that we have now, period. No, clearly not. Yeah, clearly not. And so the answer the, is- The yields well, are not sustainable lots though. Okay. There's lots of conversations about meat eating, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's certainly on the agenda. Maybe we should talk about that. But I mean, th those kind of radical changes, uh, I think, are the sorts of things that will be needed because, I mean, eat eating meat is an incredibly wasteful way of getting calories. I think it costs like 10 times the amount of land and everything for the same calorie consumption. And so that's a choice that maybe we have to learn to do without. Well, it depends on the meat. Chicken's a pretty good deal. Uh, Grass-fed beef isn't a bad deal either because that's eating, that's turning stuff we can't use into food we can. I mean, but these are all, you know, all in moderation, okay? I, no quarrel with the idea that the way we do it now is feedlots is, 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 is a very bad way. But um, let's, um, well, we can, you and I can continue this, uh, you know, Outside. Yeah, let's just somebody else have a voice. Yeah, yeah I don't I, think I will, we have any fun. I'm on board with that. So. Fundamental difference. I would add, though, that nitrogen use in agriculture, i.e., the, the way we do it now, there's a lot of things we can do to improve the efficiency of it. In other words, not to waste so much and have it go to the atmosphere as nitrous oxide or into waterways as nitrate. And in addition, Africa particularly Kenya, where I have a little bit of background from what I've been looking at, the, the nitrogen use is extremely low. So if you can provide more there, then the return on investment is huge and they're using it at such low levels that they're not gonna be wasting it. Um, so grain yields in Africa are about four times less than they are in the United States. And it's mostly because of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andrew, I had a question about um, how does food waste um, play into this in terms of how much food that we throw out? Um, how much of a factor is that? Well, the number that usually is given is that about a third of the food that's produced doesn't make it to human consumption from for, at some point along the, the, the system. Either it, you know, it spoils before it reaches the market, it's inefficiently processed, so we throw a good deal of it away, or we simply discard it because it arrives and we don't use it properly. 
So yeah, a third loss, and, and some of it is, is spoilage that can be ad addressed properly. Again, in, in Africa, spoilage is a big problem. Uh, if we had more refrigeration, uh, that would be a big help. Well, they don't. So that's another, I mean, I have colleagues who work very actively on trying to reduce the losses in, in the system. Uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement, which is good news because wherever there's you know, profligate waste, there's gains to be made. But there are still limits, and especially in places like Africa, because they, they, power is so scarce that refrigeration isn't, isn't an option for most people. But um, thinking of what we can really do, um, well, I, I, I was harping on what we, we really can't do. There can't be a sudden shock of stopping to use fixed nitrogen because half the world would starve. I mean, we have to come off slowly and organic agriculture can only do part of the job. Um, and in terms of, that mammalian dominance, you know, so much of the mammalian biomass is our animals. Well, some of them are much more efficient than others. Um, chickens are good, pigs aren't too bad. That's the kind of choices that the Western world can start to make. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen these more revolutionary ideas that we're all going to eat insects. Um, uh, I have a wonderful quote from an Australian. Uh, objector to that, who, who somewhere is on the internet saying, uh, I'm quoting here, I, I'll eat politicians before I eat crickets. Um, but uh, <laughs> what's wrong with that? <laughs> uh, um, well, I think the crickets might actually be more, more nutritious, but the, um, yeah, exot and, and you know, you've seen there's a lot of elaborate um, claims, I would say, in the uh, biotech business about, you know, artificial meats, where you they claim that they have a very much lower land and water footprint, um, but they're industrial, highly processed products, which are made in a few central processing units. I mean, it's it's a very industrial process. And it's extremely energy dependent. So I'm not sure how big of a part of the solution artificial meat is. I mean, it always seems to me that the world has wonderful vegetarian cuisines, you know, which are nutritious and interesting. And maybe more emphasis on that is, is a better way out than trying to have industrially produced, highly processed artificial meat, which... At the moment, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen it or on sale or even has anybody eaten artificial meats like Impossible Burgers anywhere? Yeah, we tried it. It's OK. Yeah. It's but food. It's it's, uh, it's basically you're paying prime beef mm -hmm. prices for hamburger and it's sort of not the best hamburger either. So no. it, it, it's not a giant opportunity for for marketing. Um <laughs> Cindy, you turned your mic on. Yeah, I'd like to say something about waste. Um, I work in a, I work in a Lodge Elementary. I've worked there for 24 years. And um, when you have politicians making um, policies on what children can eat, um, it's, it's absurd if you saw the amount of food that gets thrown away. When children go through the line, they have to pick three items regardless if they want them or not, they have to pick three items, you know, like uh, a, a fruit. Uh, I, I'm not even sure what it is. It's so absurd that I, I don't even pay attention. Then they walk out of the line and they put it in a bowl because they're not going to eat it. And then they take the bowl and they throw it in the garbage. Every day, just one school, 330 kids, throw away tons of food every day. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that we can do, but it, it requires a lot of logistics and plant, is recycling things. And that includes uh, human and animal wastes. 
that if, if you start to retrieve the nitrogen and the phosphorus that, that humans and animals put out in urine and feces and <clears throat> process it properly and then return it to the land, that's a way of unhooking us from quite a lot of the, the nitrogen demand. And, and composting food is, is part of that. But right now, we're not well set up to do it. Um, if I can give you a little narrative, when I was growing up in post-World War II Britain with, with rationing and everything, we had two garbage collections a week. One was the what they called the dustman, who came to pick out mostly the ashes from boilers, because we didn't throw much away in those days apart from ash. And the others were the was the pig bins, who picked up, you know, vegetable stuff that we threw out, which sat in the, the bin for a week, so it wasn't very appetizing, but that went to pig farms. So there was an efficient recycling system for food waste in the 50s that, that we dismantled. Anybody else have anecdotes from the past of how things actually were in a way more sustainable? Tony, you grew up in England somewhat after me, I think. But do you, did you have pig bins? We didn't. We didn't have pig bins, but that might have been because we were in a London suburb, not in anywhere particularly rural. So that it might have been a little bit different. But I, I only remember the bin collection. Um, no, well, we we were in Northwest Kent, and there were farms within a shortish distance. Yeah, so that would that might might have been a bit. Different. But I was going to say that I have I have a colleague from many many years ago. We were at grad school together, and one of his businesses is um, trying to re remediate the atmosphere uh, with bacteria, and the bacteria basically uh, consume CO two, and then when they die, it basically goes back into the soil as carbon. So he's, he's also from a rural background. So he knows a fair number of farmers and he has a, like a consortium of about 400, 500 farmers scattered around Australia. And they basically are trying to remediate the soil by you know, minimizing fertilizer use and essentially using these bacteria to recarbonize the soil because the carbon content of the soil in Australia plummeted over the last 200 years. And so the, basically the soil is just dust. There's nothing nothing living in it. And they're trying to restore living soil so that you can grow things without having to use, you know, lots of fertilizers and lots of pesticides. And it's, 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 it's sort of working. They're not, he says, they're not so ideological that they never use fertilizer. They never use pesticides, but they try to, uh, they're able to cut it down very substantially. So. Well, we, we have Jose had his hand up and Bill too. So let, let's go mm -hmm. to Jose first. So. Um, so I have a question that is sort of feels a little dark and a little pessimistic, but, but it also feels like the elephant in the room, at least to me, which is, I mean, ultimately the problem is too many people, right? And so obviously there's no, there's no good way to fix that. Um, but, but am I, am I wrong in, in, in coming to that conclusion or is that sort of true? There are too many Americans, Jose. Um, that may be the case. Well, if you replaced us with Africans, there would be much less problem. <laughs> I, I think that's a very harsh way of saying what I would say, which is that we, we can definitely sustain the present population and maybe about a billion more because you know agriculture is continuing to deliver on increases in yield and they're also doing it more efficiently uh, but we're not we're not capable of going probably beyond 10 billion but we can if we rearranged how we did things we can sustain the present population but as tony says we can't sustain them at levels even of western europe uh, consumption uh, and let alone North, North America, which is maybe double what Western Europe is as a whole. So this is something that we'll get on to the, to the next class if you come to it, but that, you know, the, the, the conclusion is that endless growth has to stop 
and we don't really know what that looks like. And because that involves a whole change of values as to what it is, and as, as other people were saying earlier, Bill, I mean, what do we find? What do we find truly valuable? Is it more stuff, uh, or is it these more human things? And and that's where you know the church has potentially a huge role to play in in, in articulating a, a more profound meaning to life than going shopping. Uh, but uh, so it, I, I'm, as, I mean, I, from what I know of agriculture, and I'm, I've been looking at this for, for 30 years now, I, I'm not pessimistic about the ability to sustain 9 million humans. I am pessimistic <clears throat> about trying to have everybody reach the standard of life that Europe and North America have, in, and including us having to roll ours back. We have to do that. I think there's no other way. Bill. Okay. Uh, one, yeah, I've, I've had this in discussions before and never come up with the answer. And that is, you know, what is the godly way to manage our herd, as it were? Because we're not doing a good job. <laughs> anyway. Well, it, maybe discussion for another time. But anyway, what got me on here to start with, you made me think of something that I don't know, maybe is a little funny, but back when we were. Uh, anyway, when I was little on my granny's farm, there wasn't indoor plumbing and there really wasn't an outhouse. Everyone used a chamber pot and threw it in the uh, hog pen in the next morning. And it just kind of got all mixed in with the mud and we never saw it again, pretty much. <laughs> <That's> part. <laughs> so, uh, just how things have once been done, anyway. Uh. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Claudia. Yeah, I, I was watching a documentary about Europe farming in the Middle Ages, and that's exactly what they did. So they they mixed uh, human remain human production uh, with with uh, moth, and they didn't use it immediately. They left it for one year, so it couldn't pass diseases, but they used it as fertilizer, yeah. yeah. Well, it, it worked. It just also happens to have hepatitis A and other things, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's why they, they <laughs> had they have this, this uh, use of waiting for a year or something. I, I don't know now how it would work, but yeah, there should be processes of, uh, Making this not not a human disease propagation, but but a good way of fertilizing and recycling human uh, number two. <laughs> no, I, I going back to the issue of what do we do? I I think an, another thing that we don't do is stop having children because that's a very um, you know, firstly it's a sort of an it, it, it it's not you have to sustain the population and if you're going to trim it you have to slow it do it slowly not like the chinese tried to do it with a one child policy because that creates a, a a demographic structure which is unable to support its older people in 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 later years the, the us is not in too bad demographic shape much of europe is in a terrible shape and south korea is even worse i mean i think their fertility rate is down to 0.8 children per female now uh, and, and in Italy, it's it's not much above one, I think. So these are societies that have entered a period of, of, of really terminal decline, and that isn't the solution. So that's why it's wonderful to see in the church people having children, and that's 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 wonderful. You know, that that's the answer is not to stop having children. The answer is to stop having children with two pickup trucks each. You know. Um, Or adopt children. Yep, that's another solution too. Absolutely. Well, um, Andrew, I'm, I'm noticing the time, and um, I want to make sure you had a chance to say any anything to close this out, and then people can certainly stay on with you if you want to. Uh, but I want to kind of respect our, our um, clock here. But um, 
Is there any any kind of closing thing that you want that also will kind of point us towards next week and and how this how it's just been wonderful and I really appreciate just everybody's thoughtful comments and and input into your presentation. So, but any any closing you would like to do? I I would just say that next week's going to be more numbers, but it's also going to be maybe more humor. Uh, there's um. Uh, it, it, it gets to the point where some of these things you either laugh or cry, and I've decided to laugh, and, and you can join me in doing it. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, I wish we had more time for conversation, and I wish I was in the same room with you, actually. But uh, please, If you please. want to stay around, I'm more than happy to leave it on. Um, we can, uh, if for anybody yeah. wants to, but I, I yeah, do want to. If anybody has anything else, I'm happy to stay too. Okay. Oh. So let's close in a prayer here. Um, Father Manley, would you um, pray for us? Oh, I'd be happy to. Mm -hmm. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Father, remind us of this great big ball that you created for us to live upon you told us that we should keep it and garden it teach us how to be responsible and how we care for it in the name of your son jesus christ amen